With our series, our mega series that started six months ago, and the portion of the series that we're in right now, and that is the truth about the Sabbath, and more importantly, how to keep the Sabbath holy, part two. Before I begin, I want to again make it very, very clear that I, by God's grace, never have and never will ever have the audacity to utilize this pulpit to attack any one individual any one family, any one group. Everything that I share, beloved, is strictly and solely from this book, from God's Word. <clears throat> I believe I shared with you at some point, I'll never forget how it impacted me, but many of you know that my father is a minister, <coughs> and my father, you know, they, they were in a church that the, they owned, so they were able to come any day of the week. You know, we're going to keep on praying and hoping that soon we can get there. But um, it was Wednesday night prayer meeting. And my father preached a sermon. A raw, organic, thus saith the Lord sermon. And when it was over, you know, he stood at the door and I stood there with him. And I'll never forget when this lady, who rarely came to Wednesday night prayer meeting, she would come on Sabbath, but rarely on Wednesday nights. And, you know, my dad was just saying hi and bye to everyone. When all of a sudden this lady says, Listen, the next time that you want to tell me something, say it in my face. I was like, wow, I wasn't expecting that one. The lady was furious. And she literally told my dad, the next time you've got something to say to me, say it in my face. And don't use the pulpit to try to, you know, throw the rock and hide the hand. And I was like, how is my dad going to respond to this? And my dad said, well, if you give me a second, let me just finish saying bye to these people. And please, let me speak to you for a moment. When it was done, he went up to her and he says, Sister, you know that you rarely come on Wednesdays. I want you to see here, and he pulled out his, you know, we're talking back in the day, his notes were handwritten, and he showed her his handwritten notes. And he says, I did this about two weeks ago. How was I supposed to know you were going to show up? You almost never show up on Wednesdays. And you can clearly see the handwritten notes. I did this over two weeks ago. Well, at that point, she didn't really know what to say. She ended up apologizing. But the bottom line is, many times, when the Lord is trying to speak to us, We can many times not like what the Lord is trying to say. 
And many times we can try to guilt the preacher. You guys remember the spirit of prophecy quote I shared with you guys when Ellen White said, it's sad that when I share with the brethren what the Lord has put in my heart to share, many of them think that it is Ellen White who is coming down on them. When it's nothing could be further from the truth. I'm simply sharing what the Lord has put in my heart. Well, this is one of the touchiest subjects to preach on. There are certain subjects that certain pastors, no, 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 let me rephrase. There are certain subjects that most pastors will not touch because it's too inconvenient. Oh, yeah, pisar demasiados callos. I'm going to get too many people mad at me. Well, I already told you, and I've been telling you that by God's grace, I hope and pray that the day never comes where I become one of those preachers. Because I'm going to share what thus saith the Lord from Genesis to Revelation without leaving anything out. And if anyone happens to get offended or bothered, I would wish, I would wish that we could sit down and, and that you show me, please show me how I am in any way attacking you. Because all I'm sharing is the Word of God for everyone beginning with me. So I hope that that is clear. What does Acts chapter 17 verse 30 say? This is the way we started last week and I'm just quickly recapping. The Bible says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Same verse, different version. God overlooks it as long as you don't know any better. But that time has passed. The unknown is now known, and God is calling for a radical life change. So it makes it super, super clear that being the fact that we're learning how to keep the Sabbath holy, you not ought to feel bad if you have been breaking the Sabbath in every way, shape, form, and fashion. Because you didn't know. If you hear, if you heard last week, if you hear this week, if you hear next week, oh man, I do that. Oh man, I've done that too. Oh man, I do that. Don't worry. The Lord is not judging you. Don't oh, judge me. But what does the Bible say? Now that we have the light, what are we going to do? That's what, that's where the rubber meets the road. I asked you this question last week, hopefully you guys remember the answer. What is the number one way to prove our love and our loyalty to God? Obedience. Obedience, exactly. To follow His commandments over man's traditions and laws. Jesus Christ said it Himself, could not be more clear in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, what? Go to church, be nice, help old ladies cross the street, don't cheat on your taxes. <laughs> no, if you love me, Keep my commandments. Now last week we took a look at what God said to remember and what man has said to forget. Yes, I'm talking about the truth of the Sabbath. And now we begin part two of how to keep the Sabbath holy. Now, I usually around this point touch on this subject. Because <clears throat> this is a question for many, especially if you're brand new to the church. Oh, this question is constantly being thrown, and the newer you are, the more. Man, what is up with the Seventh-day Adventist church and the Sabbath, man? Why so much focus on the Sabbath? It's only one of the Ten Commandments. I don't hear too much. Well, no, I, should, I don't hear as much about the other commandments as I do about the Sabbath. Why so much focus on the Sabbath? This is one of the most popular questions that as a new person 
in the church, you hear. And you ask, well, besides the fact, what we already covered last week, that it's the only day, the seventh day, that God rested on, blessed, and sanctified to make holy. Besides that, we already covered that. Do you guys remember when we decided to search for God's true church? We found the false system of religion that Satan uses on this planet to deceive people. Well, when we looked for God's true church, you'll recall we went to the book of Revelation chapter 12. And there in Revelation chapter 12, we found all the characteristics that fit God's true church. We followed God's true church from its inception up until today, 2022. And we found all the characteristics for God's true church. You recall? God's true church, according to Revelation 12 and 14, had to preach the three angels' message. Had to come up after 1798. Why? Because Revelation 12 says that God's true church was what? From 538 AD to 1798. Hiding. Hiding. So it could not have come up until after 1798. We also learned from God's true, uh, from Revelation 12, that God's true church would keep all 10 commandments, not excluding the fourth. We learned that God's true church would have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. And we learned that God's true church would be based solely, 100%, the sole authority of that church would have to be the Word of God. Isaiah 8.20, to the law and to the testimonies, if they speak not according to this word, is because there is no light in them. Revelation 12.17, and the dragon was wroth, angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, those who have the testimony of Jesus, and keep the Ten Commandments. Amen. Now, beloved, I asked you already. I'm open. I'm totally open. Please name me one church on the face of the earth that fits each and every one of these characteristics that are found in Revelation 12 and Revelation 14 as identifying God's true church outside of the Seventh-day Adventist church. The Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church on the face of the earth that fits each and every one of these characteristics. So nobody can say, ah, well, Pastor Serna just likes to you know, say that his church is the true church. No, I took you guys to the lab, to God's Word. And Revelation 12 and 14 clearly indicate the characteristics of God's true church. Now, among these characteristics, one of the ones that tend to be a little, I don't know about that one, is which one? The spirit of prophecy. Well, you guys recall that unlike, sadly, a lot of even Seventh-day Adventist churches, I did not dare to stand up here and say, oh yeah, by the way, uh, the Revelation 12 does say that God's true church keeps the Ten Commandments and has this testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy. Uh, we have that. We have a lady called Ellen G. White and we believe in her to be a prophet. The end. Let's move on. I didn't do that. You recall that we spent two full Sabbaths breaking down the 10 biblical tests of a true prophet. The Bible says if anyone says that they are a prophet, don't just believe them. What does the Bible say? Try every spirit. Test the prophet to see if they are of God. And the Bible gives us 10 biblical tests. And we put Ellen G. White her life and her writings to the test and she passed every single one of these tests with flying colors. Amen? So beloved, I want to hope and pray that I have done my due diligence in showing you from God's word that the Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church that is fitting the characteristics of the remnant of God's true church. Not to mention, by the way, just, just reminding you, remember, that, remember this? The false system of religion that Satan has established on this planet, what do they say? This is coming from the Roman Catholic Church themselves. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change. You, know, you got to think about that. You know, we, we, we read this and it goes, just flies over us. How old is the Roman Catholic Church? <laughs> it's about as old as you can get. 
in terms of churches that are still standing. The Roman Catholic Church began to arise approximately 300 years after Christ had ascended up to heaven. Wow, almost 2,000 years old. You'd think, man, you could do a lot in 2,000 years. But you know what they say? They say that the boldest thing, the most revolutionary thing that we have done as a church in approximately 2,000 years, it occurred in the first century. What was it? When we took God's holy day, the Sabbath, and changed it from Saturday to Sunday. The new day of the Lord was chosen not from any direction noted in the scriptures, but from the church's sense of its own power. But here it is. This is why I chose this quote. Because they already remember we established going to Daniel 7, Revelation 13, and Revelation 17 proved to be the false system of religion that Satan is using on this planet to deceive the masses. What do they say? People who think that the Holy Scriptures should be the sole authority, one of the characteristics, by the way, that the true church of God must have, that the Bible is the sole authority. They say people who think that the Holy Scriptures should be the sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep Saturday holy. Can I get an amen? They continue on. Seventh-day Adventists, this is still them talking, are the only body of Christians with the Holy Bible alone as their teacher, who find no warrant in its pages for the change of the day from the seventh to the first. Hence their appellation, their name, Seventh-day Adventists. They set apart Saturday for the exclusive worship of God in obedience to the commandment of God himself. Another characteristic of God's true church must obey all ten commandments. This commandment, which is repeatedly reiterated in both the Old and New Testament, which was kept by the children of Israel for thousands of years to this day, and which was also kept by the Son of God, Jesus Christ himself, while he was here on earth. I mean, folks, how much more proof do you want that the Seventh-day Adventist church is God's true church here on earth? It's the only church that meets every single one of the characteristics given to us in Revelation 12 and 14. And the enemy is straight out saying the complete opposite of us. The only ones that really can call themselves Protestants are the Seventh-day Adventists. But again, we're, we're looking at why so much focus on the Sabbath. Check this out. If you look at just the name, you look at our name, Seventh-day Adventists, go to any place you see our, our name, it should kind of strike you. In our name, we see the Sabbath. What is the church called? Seventh-day Adventists. The church is not called Adventists of those who don't murder. Adventists that don't commit adultery. Adventists who don't steal. See, what does Adventist mean? That you believe in the advent of Jesus Christ. But you realize that we could have been called Adventists that any other commandment. But for a reason, we are called Seventh-day Adventists. The Sabbath is in our very name. Now, one can think, of course, ah, well, anybody could have just picked that. Did you know that the spirit of prophecy shares that the name Seventh-day Adventist <clears throat> was not picked out of a jar, okay? It was not Tin Marin, that's not how they picked it. <clears throat> Check this out. Quote, spirit of prophecy, testimonies to the, uh, well, I don't think it's showing here. It's testimonies for the church, volume 1, page 224, if I remember correctly. God says, quote, through the spirit of prophecy, I was shown 
in regard to the remnant people of God taking a name, no name which we can take will be appropriate, but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as a peculiar people. Wow! Are you guys getting this? The spirit of prophecy is telling us it was shown to me. The Lord gave us this name because the Lord said it had to be a name that would not only be in accord with our profession and expressing our faith, but it must mark us as peculiar. Amen. Doesn't the Bible say in Deuteronomy 14 that we are to be peculiar people? Doesn't the Bible say in 1 Peter that we are to be a peculiar people? Now let me ask you, if our church was called Adventists who don't murder, does that make us peculiar? Or does that make us pretty much like any other Christian? Adventists who don't commit adultery. Adventists who don't steal. Adventists who don't... We could go on and on. Every church does that. Oh, but when you say Seventh-day Adventist, because we keep all Ten Commandments, whoa, now we're peculiar. She goes on to say, the name Seventh-day Adventist is a stat... Look at this, look at this! The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Wow! She is saying, beloved, the name Seventh-day Adventist is a sermon to the Protestant world. We are preaching truth, just our very name is a rebuke saying, why aren't you also seventh day? The Bible wasn't written for a certain group of people. The Bible was given to everyone. God's seventh day Sabbath is not, doesn't apply to only certain people. Yeah, I, I gotta say, just I loved it, and I almost wanted to stand up and applaud. Years ago, a lot of us from the church I used to attend, an Adventist church, we went to go here. Uh, I don't know, by show of hands, how many of you know Sandy Patty? Not too many of you. Okay. Well, she's kind of old school. Awesome singer, awesome gospel singer. But she's not Seventh day Adventist, she's just a Christian. But beautiful music. <clears throat> we went to go hear her. And it was a Friday evening. And at some point in the concert, <clears throat> she said, because she came to an Adventist church to sing. I mean, she travels, she would travel to all denominations to sing. She said, all right, all right, like mid-concert. Mid okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and try to speed things along. And I'm not going to keep you here too late. We're going to want to... You know, get you out of here on time because, you know, I know that it's your Sabbath and you guys got to get up early tomorrow for church. So I, I know it's your Sabbath. And somebody from the crowd yelled out, it's your Sabbath too. Woo! Uh, she just made a face like, you know. But more truth could not have been spoken. But see, that's the way denominations look at things. Oh, well, you believe that way, I believe this way, you believe that way. It doesn't matter how we worship as long as we all come together in Jesus. That's what matters. No, it doesn't. Not according to the Word of God. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a rebuke to the Protestant world. Here is the line of distinction between the worshipers of God and those who worship the beast and receive his mark. Man! Now God is telling us through the spirit of prophecy, in your name draws the line between the true worshipers of God and those who are worshipers of the beast and will receive his mark. It is, look at this, it is because his saints, his true worshipers, us, are keeping all ten of the commandments that the dragon makes war upon them. See, the dragon is not wrath, is not angry 
with the other churches that are only keeping some commandments. The, the dragon, according to Revelation 12, 17, is angry with God's true church, the one that keeps all ten. And by the way, just another little, you know, cherry on the cake, of why you see the Seventh-day Adventist church focused more on the Seventh-day Sabbath commandment than any other. <clears throat> I know nobody's perfect. We all, you know, as the saying goes in Spanish, tenemos pata de que coger, como dicen. But you know what? I would venture to say, I hope I'm right in what I'm saying, but I would venture to say that the vast majority of you here are not thieves. I would venture to say that the vast majority of you respect your parents. I would say that the vast majority of you are not murderers. The vast majority of you are faithful to your spouse. But I cannot say the vast majority of us keep the Sabbath holy the way it was meant to be kept. So could it be possible that that is why we focus more on the seventh day because that one tends to be the one that gives us a little bit more of a struggle? I can almost guarantee you that there's at least one person in this church right now. I can almost, I'd be willing to, if I was a betting man, put money on it. That there's at least one person in this church right now that can say, I don't worship false gods. I don't bow down before images. I don't take the name of God in vain. I don't steal. I don't commit adultery. I don't kill. Oh, but I do work on Sabbath. Why is it that the fourth one is the quote-unquote easiest to break? There's a reason why. And we're going to get to that in a moment. No, beloved, there's a reason why we focus on this commandment. But let me tell you this. The main reason why the enemy is attacking the fourth commandment like no other. I know that some have seen this, but some have not. <clears throat> I think I even used Justin as an example here once for this. I'm going to use him again. Justin, come on up here. <clears throat> All right. As my brother Justin stands here, I want you guys to go with me on this analogy. Remember, I'm still just answering the question, why focus so much on the Sabbath? <clears throat> Let's suppose that my friend here is an atheist. Okay, just pretend. He does not believe in God, in any deity. He is an atheist, 100%. Okay? Now, let me ask you. Let's go through the Ten Commandments. The first commandment is, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. Question, is it possible, possible, not for sure, but possible, that my friend the atheist here could totally not have false gods that he's worshipping? Is that possible? Yes. Commandment two, don't bow down to any graven image. Is it possible for my friend the atheist here who hates God, doesn't believe in God at all, to not bow down to images? Is that possible? Number three, don't take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Is it possible for my friend the atheist here to not curse and cuss and take God's name in vain? Yes. Let's skip the fourth. Five, is it possible that my buddy the atheist here honors his father and mother? Is it possible that my buddy the atheist here does not kill? Is it possible that my buddy the atheist here is faithful to his spouse? Is it possible that my buddy the atheist here does not lie? He's an honest man. Is that possible? Is it possible that he doesn't steal or cheat? But he's still an atheist. Is it possible finally that he would not covet anything that does not belong to him? Could he be an atheist and still do that? I just proved to you that a man that does not believe in God at all could potentially 
keep nine of the commandments. Now I ask you, is it possible by any stretch of the imagination that my friend the atheist here could keep the seventh day holy? Impossible. Because the reason why he would keep the seventh day holy is because the fourth commandment says six days God created the sun, the moon, the stars, the sea, and all that in them is. But on the seventh day, he rested. Therefore, because he acknowledges that God is the creator of the universe, this fourth commandment can now be kept because he's accepting God as the creator of the universe. Thank you, brother. Do you now see why the devil attacks the fourth commandment more than any other commandment? Do you see why? You think it's coincidence that every single Christian denomination on this planet keeps all nine commandments, but coincidentally, we just got rid of the fourth. That was precise, strategic, precision attack. Satan knew, ah, this fourth commandment. <laughs> They've got to know God. They've got to have a relationship with God. They've got to have what will give them salvation in order to keep that commandment. We gotta get rid of that commandment yesterday. <sighs> and finally, in conclusion, to answer that question, why so much focus on the Sabbath? Beloved, we're all waiting for this day, amen? But you see, on this day, there will only be two types of people. Those who will be saved and those who will be lost. Now, you know how you tell them apart? You know how to distinguish between the lost and the saved? This is not the sermon that is going to break that down. We're going to get into that very soon. Very soon, like in the next month and a half we're going to deal with it but i just i'm just going to touch on it right now the way you can tell them apart is because those who are lost are lost because they are marked with the mark of the beast how do you know those who will be saved because it's those who are sealed with the seal of the living god it all boils down to salvation versus damnation. It all boils down to the mark of the beast and the seal of God. Would you not say then that the seal of God and how to get it would be one of the most important things we should be focusing on? Take a wild stab at how much the fourth commandment, the Sabbath day commandment, is interjected, intertwined, and based and founded on the seal of God. So, beloved, I hope that that answers the question, why so much focus on the Sabbath? Now, granted, we've been here over six months now as a ministry, and this is the first time that I'm really breaking down and dissecting the Sabbath and how to keep it holy. Don't get it twisted. Believe me, we're going to have soon a series on God's Ten Commandments. And we're going to have a Sabbath for every commandment. But this one, for many reasons, I wanted to break down first and spend just a little more time on. You all recall that I asked you last week, by show of hands, how many here love God? I asked that question. How many here love God? Everybody raised their hand. There was not one person that didn't raise their hand. Then I said, or I asked, why do you think that all of you, all of you raised your hand and said, yeah, I love God. <clears throat> but not all of you are keeping the Sabbath holy the way you should. I ended up proving to you what the Bible says in Romans 8, 7, that the, the carnal mind is enmity against God. By nature, we hate God. Every time I say that, somebody goes, oh, how could you have said that? By nature, we hate God. It's no surprise. 
And I always hit it home the moment that I say, just imagine, after the Sabbath is over, after Sabbath school, the divine worship hour, A-Y, yeah, we're going home Saturday night. Ooh, that's what we live for. Us Seventh-day Adventists, we live for pizza and a movie on Saturday night. Like if that was our true Sabbath. And I always, I always get to when I ask the question, imagine, yeah, church is over, you've been in church all day, you're headed home, and you get a call. And it's somebody from church saying, hey, come back. The pastor just found some notes. We're going to go for another four-hour sermon. Yeah, how many of us are like, really? Wow, eh, let's turn around. We know that that's not the case. But yet, many of us have no problem watching a three-hour movie <clears throat> Many of us don't have a problem watching a three-hour game. <clears throat> I broke down last week. For those who love the NFL, for those who love the NBA, <laughs> did somebody say, what's that? <laughs> cute. Very cute. <laughs> Why is it that we would love to watch a two to three hour game. Love to talk about our favorite players, our favorite plays, even watch documentaries on, on, on the best moves and the MVPs. Why? Because we love football. We love basketball. Those of us that are sports fans, you got no problem being all day watching a game, watching a documentary, talking statistics, all about sports. Why? Because you love sports. Why is it that that's not the way you feel about God? Hmm. Could it be possible that when you said, yeah, I love God, you weren't really telling the truth? Wake up call. Wake up call. <clears throat> and I even joked around. I know that there's exception to the rule. But in most cases, the wives are not the ones that are crazy about the NFL and Monday Night Football and the NBA. Why is it that guys... <laughs> we'll pay and stand in line who knows how long to, 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 to you know, meet a, a, a sports star or whatever. And the wives are like, whatever. Because the wives don't love that in general. You are all for what you truly love. So if you're not all for church and keeping the Sabbath holy, could it be possible that you're deceiving yourself into thinking you love God when you really don't love Him nearly as much as you'd like to think you do? <clears throat> remember, beloved, I shared with you last week that the commandment says remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It doesn't say to make it holy. I shared with you that God gave us the Sabbath. He made it, and He made it holy. And when He gave it to us, He said, I want you to keep it the way it is. That's why I even gave you the analogy when you go to museums and whatnot, and you see paintings that are inside glass and very well preserved, and even the, the, the temperature is conditioned. Why? Because they're trying to keep it in its original state. Well, God has entrusted us with His holy Sabbath for us to keep it in the state in which he gave it to us and that is holy now what does it mean to keep the sabbath holy we already looked at a few of these things last week but again i want to remind you that hosea 4 6 says my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge so if I'm breaking down from God's word, beloved, how to keep the Sabbath holy, it's because I'm trying by God's grace to avoid the destruction of many. So, <clears throat> how do we go about keeping the Sabbath holy? Well, oh, this is what I told you before. Let me go through this real quick. I already went through this, this analogy. <clears throat> Oh, this is something that hit home that I want to say again for those that are here that were not here last week. Thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of Seventh-day Adventists have never kept the Sabbath holy. 
What? Así como lo oyen. Thousands have not. Where on earth does it say that showing up to church from 11 to 12 or 11 to 1, oh, that's keeping the Sabbath. No, that's what every other denomination does. Every other denomination, that's what they do. But how many Sunday goers keep Sunday holy? They don't. So many have never kept the Sabbath holy. They remember the Sabbath, yeah. Remember the Sabbath day. Oh, I remember today's the Sabbath. But keeping it holy? Oh, that's a whole different story. <clears throat> Listen to this. Councils of the Church, page 263. Far more sacredness, holiness, is attached to the Sabbath than is given to by many professed Sabbath keepers. The Lord has been greatly dishonored by those who have not kept the Sabbath according to the commandment, either in the letter or in the spirit. And he calls for a reform in the observance of the Sabbath. I shared this last week. And I just, I don't know if it hit any of you. Far more sacredness, more holiness is attached to the Sabbath than many Sabbath keepers are giving it. And this was said a hundred years ago. ¿Qué será today? I gave you the analogy, just, just a quick example of how far we are from keeping the Sabbath the way we should. All through the week, we are to have the Sabbath in mind and be making preparation to keep it according to the commandment. Our week should look something like this. Yes, here's our Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, but everything is focusing on the Sabbath. Every day of the week, we're doing something physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally to prepare for God's seventh day Sabbath. All through the week, we are to have the Sabbath in mind and making preparations to keep it according to the commandment. But yet, most of us don't even remember the Sabbath until about 9.30, 10, 10.30 in the morning on Saturday. <clears throat> so how should we keep the Sabbath? Well, something that we didn't touch on last week, when does the Sabbath even begin? When does it begin? From sunset to sunset, God's Sabbath rest is from Friday evening sunset to Saturday evening sunset. Something like this. This is <clears throat> or are the hours of the Sabbath. <clears throat> Why? Because we feel like it? The Bible says in Genesis 1.5, creation, God called the light day and the darkness he called night and so what the evening and the morning were the first day doesn't that sound weird shouldn't it be the morning and the evening are the first day no not according to god to god the day begins in the evening look at the second day god <clears throat> and god called the firmament heaven so the evening and the morning were the second day now some of you have seen this many of you have not By show of hands, how many know who this guy is? Okay, some of you know who Kevin Trudeau is. This guy is all about, he's a naturista and a half. It's all about uh, doing things natural. And, uh, you know, his book, Natural Cures, they, talking about the medical world, don't want you to know about. I want you to know this guy is not in any way, shape, or form a Seventh-day Adventist. From what I understand, he's not even a Christian. He's just somebody that really is into health and into nature. Look what he wrote. I just found this interesting. I thought I should share this. In his book, he said, I mean, he, a scientist at heart, he studies ongoing and ongoing this life of nature and how to do things holistically. He says, quote, you need to reduce stress in your life to live, I'm sorry, let me repeat, you need to reduce stress in your life to live a long, happy, healthy, disease-free life. Let me give you a list of what I think are the most powerful ways to reduce stress. And he goes on and gives a list of things that he recommends that you do to reduce stress. Look what number nine was. He wrote, rest from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. Now why? He gives a scientific explanation. He says, quote, 
Each week, the moon cycles are in position to promote healing and rejuvenation in the body. Resting during this time promotes the optimal rejuvenation of your cells. A scientific, nothing to do with the Bible, reason why, you know, we've discovered that resting from Friday sundown to Saturday sundown, that's when the moon cycles are in position and promote the most healing. It's the most optimum time for the rejuvenation of your cells. Wow. <clears throat> God knew what he was doing. Amen. While preparation for the Sabbath is to be made all through the week, as we've just seen, Friday is to be the special preparation day. Friday, beloved, is our final day where we do everything to make sure we are ready for God's Sabbath. Look at this. On Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. Not start. A lot of people think that, oh, Friday, the day of preparation, okay, Friday is when I start getting ready. No, Friday should be when the end of the preparation comes. The preparation is throughout the whole week. But on Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. See that all the clothing is in readiness and that all the cooking is done. Let the booths, let the booths be blackened, the baths taken. The Sabbath is not to be given for the repairing of garments, to cooking of food, to pleasure seeking, or to any other worldly employment. Before the setting of the sun, let all secular work be laid aside and all secular papers be put out of sight. Parents, explain your work. In other words, this preparation and its purpose to your children. And let them share in your preparation to keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. <clears throat> It is possible to do this. If you make it a rule, you can do it. Beloved, one of the reasons, <clears throat> and again, this is not a seminar now on child rearing. That's coming too eventually, what God says regarding child rearing. But beloved, one of the reasons why <clears throat> I can today, by God's grace, Say, I know that my children keep the Sabbath holy. Is because my wife and I were teaching them about the Sabbath and how to keep the Sabbath holy before they could talk. Did you get that? My wife and I, by God's grace, we're teaching our children how to keep the Sabbath holy before they could talk. Now you might think, <laughs> what are you really teaching them? What we were teaching them were habits. A lifestyle. Now, it would be the weirdest thing in the world. Not now. <laughs> we could go back 10 years. When my children were 5, 6, 7 years old, it would be the weirdest thing in the world to not go to church on Sabbath. To not do certain things or to do certain things because this is what they were seeing from birth. This is what God... Oh, we're not going to get into this now because then I'll just derail and we'll, we'll go into another sermon. But what God says about raising your children in His commandments. Uh-oh. <clears throat> How many can relate to this? Don't shake, don't raise your hand. Hey, it's 7, 18 and 4 seconds. That means the Sabbath is over, buddy. Oh, you don't believe me? Look at the bulletin. There it is. Sunset. 718. Hey, isn't that when the Sabbath is over? At 718, that's sunset. <laughs> Beloved, what does God tell us regarding this? We should jealously guard the edges of the Sabbath. 
remember that every moment is consecrated holy time. What does it mean to guard the edges of the Sabbath? See, this brother was not guarding the edges of the Sabbath. Hey, it's 718 in four seconds. Bam! It's not the Sabbath anymore. Ah, uh, like Sabbath who? I would just love to know, <clears throat> ladies, let me ask you a question. Suppose you are on a date with your hubby because it's your anniversary. Well, first, he lives because he remembered. But ladies, please be honest. <clears throat> How would you feel if you are out on the town, your hubby is taking you to a beautiful dinner because it's your anniversary, and you're in the middle of enjoying his company when all of a sudden, like, whoa, it's actually midnight. You know, honey, uh, don't take this the wrong way, but technically, it's not our anniversary anymore. And there's a game that I, TiVo, that I, I really, really want to go watch. So can, can we get the check and get out of here? Hey, you, I, I was here for the anniversary. I remembered, right? <laughs> but it's not our anniversary anymore. Can, can we go now? How many of you ladies are going to be like, of course, honey. You go ahead and do that because you were here at the time. You know that you guys are going to feel offended, insulted. So... What, this was a, a robotic move for you? So obviously, you're not here at all with your mind and heart. You just wanted to complete. Hey, I showed up, okay, but it's not anniversary time anymore. That would be horrific. Well, you know how many of us do that to God? You know how many of us on Friday night, uh, uh look at the sun. It's, it's technically, it's not Sabbath yet. Um, uh, well, look, I, I still got about, you know, three seconds left. And come Sabbath sundown? <laughs> Do you see sunrise? Do you see a sun ray? No, see? Again, you keep the Sabbath here and here. <clears throat> there are many ways to break and keep the Sabbath. We don't have time, obviously, to go through all of them in one sermon. But we're going little by little. We already know, based on the actual commandment itself, that the number one way to break, I'm sorry, to keep the Sabbath, is to not work. Because God makes it clear in His command, Six days shall thy labor and do all thy work, but the seventh is the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not work. Now, there's many ways to keep the Sabbath, but for some reason, God felt that one needs to actually be mentioned in the commandment. So, out of all the ways one could break the Sabbath, working on the Sabbath would be the worst because it's the only one that God went out of His way to, with His own finger, put into the commandment. But if working is probably the worst and strongest way you can break the commandment, what would be the best way to keep it? Well, the opposite. If you're not going to work anymore, where are you going now on the Sabbath? What does God say regarding attending church? Oh, man. I wish we had a whole month just on this one. Do you know how many people have told me, uh, the commandment says to keep the Sabbath holy. It doesn't say to go to church. Technically, I could be a true, good Seventh-day Adventist my whole life and never go to church because the Bible doesn't tell me to go to church. It just says to keep the Sabbath holy. <clears throat> you know who I'm talking about. These guys. Hey, the Sabbath says rest. It's all about resting, baby. <sighs> Six days shall thy labor do all thy work, but the Sabbath day is the day of rest. <clears throat> Yes, many, many feel that the fourth commandment is a license to become a member of the Church of the Holy Mattress. <clears throat> what does God say, beloved? Spirit of Prophecy counsels to the church, page 267, quote, All heaven is keeping the Sabbath. 
but not in a listless do-nothing way. On this day, every angle of the soul should be awake. For are we not to meet with God and with Christ our Savior? So here, two things we see. One, the Sabbath is to be kept, but not in a listless do-nothing way. Like our homie that was in La Maca, he's just chilling. The Sabbath, is it not a day where we are to meet with God and with Christ? Where do you usually meet with God? Continuing on. During the week, our energies should not be so exhausted in temporal labor that on the day when the Lord rested and was refreshed, we shall be too weary to engage in His service. Oh, how many times I've heard that one. Man, you know how hard I work during the week, man. Can't get up on Saturday too, man, and go to church. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 56, verses 1 and 2. And 6 and 7. Blessed is the man that does this, that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and take hold my covenant, even them will I bring to where? My house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices, in other words, their worship, shall be accepted upon my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer. Hmm. I thought the Bible didn't talk about going to church on the Sabbath. Here, God is saying, blessed is the man that does not pollute the Sabbath, but keeps it by what? Showing up to my house of prayer. But not just that. Beloved, whose example are we as Christians supposed to follow? Jesus, right? And whose example, uh, I'm sorry, and Jesus came to this earth to give us the ultimate example of how to live life according to God's will. Amen? Amen. And what do we find Jesus doing? Luke chapter 4 verse 16. And he, Jesus, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue the church on the sabbath day and stood up to read as his what as his custom was in other words this was not a one-time thing it was his costumbre his custom to be in church every sabbath look at this it is displeasing to God for Sabbath keepers to sleep during much of the Sabbath. They dishonor their Creator in doing so, and by their example say that the six days are too precious for them to spend in resting. They must make money, although it be by robbing themselves of needed sleep, which they make up for by sleeping away holy time. They excuse themselves saying, look at this, the Sabbath was given as a day of rest. <laughs> such make a wrong useful, I'm sorry, such make a wrong use of the sanctified day. They should upon that day especially interest their families in its observance and what? Assemble at the house of prayer. With the few or with the many, as the case may be. <clears throat> We are to assemble in the house of prayer. But what about other Christians in the Bible? We saw what Jesus did. What about Apostle Paul? One of the greatest, in fact, the greatest man in the New Testament, wrote most of the New Testament. What did Apostle Paul do? Acts 17, 2. And Paul, as his manner was, again, costumbre, went into the church unto them, for three Sabbaths and reason with them from the scriptures. And by the way, when Paul would do this, what did he say? 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Paul would say, hey, you see what I'm doing? I go to church every Sabbath. Do what I do. But not because I'm anyone great. I'm following Jesus. That's what Jesus did. So do what I do, because if you're doing what I do, you're doing what Jesus did. Acts 13, 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and they went into the synagogue, the church, on the Sabbath day and sat down. Acts 13, 42, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the church, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. 
Acts 18, 4. And he, Apostle Paul, reasoned in the synagogue, the church, every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and Greeks. Acts 13, 44. And the next Sabbath day came all the whole city together to hear the word of God. Beloved, does it sound like in the New Testament, Apostle Paul and the disciples were going to church every Sabbath? You know the Sabbath, that thing that the New Testament doesn't mention? <clears throat> it is necessary. Suggested? No. Necessary that the people of God assemble to talk of Him. To interchange thoughts and ideas in regards to the truth contained in His Word. And to devote a portion of, that of time to appropriate prayer. It is necessary to assemble. But look at this. Probably the most famous text, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Having a high priest over the house of God. What is the house of God? Church. Let us draw near with a true heart and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. What are we to not forsake? The assembling of ourselves together as is the matter of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. In other words, the, as you see the day approaching, what day? The day that Jesus comes back to take us home. The closer we get to the end, the more we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together in God's house of prayer. So don't tell me that God does not talk about attending church on Sabbath. But you know what's interesting? You know what's sad? And this happens particularly the closer that we get to this day coming, the day when Jesus will return. I've been noticing, I don't know if it's hit any of you. I was born and raised in the church and I remember as a kid pretty much always seeing the same people in church every week. As once in a blue moon somebody would skip something. Have you noticed how in today's day and age, people skip church because their hair hurts? Because their shadow hurts? I mean, today, church attendance is not looked upon on something that must be done. No, no, no. If everything, if all my ducks get lined up in a row, if everything works out, you know, if everything is perfect, then maybe I'll go. Church is looked upon today like a club. I'll go if and when I feel like it. <clears throat> there are those who practically never miss church. And there are those who practically always miss church. I don't know if that's hit you too. But there are certain people, I can name them, that I don't think have missed one Sabbath. Every single Sabbath, they're in church. Why? Because they take it seriously. They take what God commanded seriously. And it's usually always the same people. Then there are those who show up once a month. If that, and it's usually always the same people. This is simply screaming what kind of a relationship you have with God. What else is the Lord trying to teach us about church attendance? Look at this. God requires, uh-oh. God requires every man to be punctual. Punctuality and decision in the work and cause of God are highly essential. You think it's coincidence that this is coming from the book Councils on Sabbath School Work? Spirit of Prophecy? Punctuality! It's a requirement for everyone. Do not allow yourself to spend the precious hours of the Sabbath in your bed. Now look at this, oh, if this is a call out, whoo, in your bed, but look at this, the heads of the house 
should be a stir early should be up early who are the ones that God wants up before anyone else on Sabbath the heads of the home the fathers the husbands but oh how sad it is the number of cases and houses where the wife the mother is trying to juggle and balance everything <laughs> and many times they're late to church because of him when he should be leading the family Oh, I knew it was going to get quiet today. <laughs> but again, don't shoot the messenger. Word of God. Spirit of prophecy. Amen. On Friday, the clothing of the children looked after during the week should be all laid out by their own hands. Did you get that? Did you, did you catch that? On Friday, the clothing of the children looked after during the week should be all laid out by their own hands under the direction of the mother so that they can dress quietly without any confusion or rushing about. See, my children know that not by Friday, by Thursday, everything that they're going to wear for the Sabbath should already be picked out, hung up, ready to go. You think that that just happened? That's a lot of work. That's a lot of training. But that's why God said, train up a child in the way he should go. Proverbs 22. But that's not what we're talking about this morning. <sighs> it is a sad failing with many that they are always behind time on Sabbath morning. In other words, always late on Sabbath. They are very particular about their own time. Oh, they can't afford to lose an hour of that. But the Lord's time, the only day out of the seven that the Lord claims as His and requires us to devote to Him, quite a portion of this is squandered away by sleeping in late in the morning. Beloved, let me ask you a question. According to Malachi 3.10, you should all know this, what does the Bible say that you are doing to God when you choose to not pay tithes and offering? One more time, a little louder. What are you doing to God? <clears throat> this is why, praise God, most of you are faithful in your tithes and your offerings. <sighs> I know I wouldn't want to be labeled as someone that's robbing God. Well, get a load of this. I left the last line of this quote out. I read it again. It is a sad failing with many that they are always behind time. In other words, late on Sabbath morning. They are very peculiar about their own time. They cannot afford to lose an hour of that. But the Lord's time, the only day out of the seven that He claims is His and requires, not suggests, commands, requires for us to devote to Him, Quite a portion of this is squandered away by sleeping late in the morning. This is the last sentence of this quote. In this... Hold on, here we go. In this, they are robbing God. The same way you rob God by choosing to not pay your tithes and offerings and rob from Him, you're robbing Him in a different way when you come late to church. It's, it's, it causes them to be behind in everything and finally results in the tardiness of the entire family at Sabbath school and perhaps even at the meeting. The meeting is another word for divine worship service. Whenever you see the word the meeting, she's describing the divine worship service. Why can we not rise early with the birds and offer praise and thanksgiving to God? Try it, brethren and sisters. Have your preparations all made the day before. And what does God tell us through the spirit of prophecy? Come promptly to the Sabbath school and meeting. 
In other words, come promptly on time to Sabbath school and to the divine worship service. And you will thereby, thereby not only benefit others, but you will reap rich blessings for yourselves. Anybody here not want rich blessings? God promises rich blessings to those that do this. And let me tell you something, I can speak from experience and from people that I know that do this. The blessings we have had because those who choose to say, you know what? I'm going to put self aside. I'm going to do what God says. Oh, you have no idea what the Lord has in store for you. If only you would let him bless you that way. And by the way, those who missed it, who are not here for Sabbath school, I hope you guys know we also have Sabbath school for children. It was beautiful this morning as we were able to see the children, the little children, like four or five years old, little children, singing, giving Bible texts of memory. Where did this happen? Sabbath school. There's no reason why all of us cannot say we will take heed to what the Lord is saying. This is, again is not me, it's God's word, spirit of prophecy. What about buying and selling on the Sabbath? Uh oh, <laughs> now I see it. <laughs> hey, <laughs> almost time to get out of here. We're almost done. Deacons, lock the doors, please. No, I'm kidding. <clears throat> Beloved, let me ask you a question. What typically happens in every and any denomination out there after church? What? You go out and eat. That is what most people do in all Sunday going churches. After church, you go out and eat. But what does the Bible say? regarding the Sabbath about buying or selling or interchanging any kind of money let me show you beloved Nehemiah chapter 13 verses 15 and 17 Nehemiah was a prophet now watch this in those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. So they bring in this work that they're going to do, but why? Because they want to sell it and buy. They want to do business. <clears throat> Look at this. And I, this is the prophet Nehemiah speaking, and I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath. What were they doing? Selling on the Sabbath. Selling, buying, exchanging monies. Now look at this. Then I, the prophet Nehemiah, contended with the nobles of Judea and said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane break the Sabbath day? Wow. Not only is God through Nehemiah saying this is wrong. You're breaking the fourth commandment. This is breaking the Sabbath. He goes a step further. How many of you guys have heard at least? I will, it's not like we're doing anything bad. It's not like we're doing something evil. Nehemiah straight out said, what evil thing is this that you do? God in his word through his prophet called spending money on the Sabbath an evil sin. Don't shoot the messenger. You got a problem with that? Take it up with God. I'm only delivering the message. This means, beloved, that going out to the market on Friday night or on Sabbath is a breaking of the fourth commandment 
and evil in the sight of God. Going out to eat after church. You can't go to a restaurant. You can't go to Taco Bell or McDonald's without paying money. Going out for coffee. Going out for ice cream. Going out to get gas. Going out to buy clothes. Anything where you are spending money, you are breaking the Sabbath. And up until this point, beloved, I, I haven't said anything. But I have been in communication with many of you that have told me, oh, I'm going to go do this or I'm going to go do that. And I've always said, they don't know. They don't know. It's okay. Now you know. Amen. And what did Acts 17.30 say? God winks at the time of ignorance. He won't judge you for what you didn't know. Now you know. And now God calls for a radical life change. And this used to, I'm telling, you, I'm telling you, the closer we get to the coming of the Son of Man. Oh, you knew that no one in the Seventh-day Adventist church dared to spend a penny on the Sabbath or on Friday night. Oh, man, we don't have any milk, we don't have no bread. Well, we're going to have to do something, but we're not going to the market now. It's already the Sabbath. No, now, eh, Diosito entenderá, Diosito entenderá, eh, whatever, let's just go. Not realizing that the only reason you're not suffering the consequence of your sin is because now there is a lag time between the action and the consequence. But believe you me, beloved, judgment day is coming and everything will be accounted for then. Another example. School. You know how many times, and please right now I can't even think of anyone specifically, so don't now, oh, I think the pastor's talking about me. Look, I've heard this a thousand times from a thousand different people. My only question is every time I hear it, I wonder if they know or not. Sometimes I know you don't know. That's fine. I always say, oh, they're going to know eventually. We're going to get there. Well, we're getting there now. You know how many times people have told me that they can't come to church because they've got something related with school? They've got something, my kid has this thing at school. <clears throat> Some of our people have sent their children to school on the Sabbath. The school authorities objected to receiving the children unless they should attend six days. Here the children of professed commandment keepers have been sent upon the Sabbath. Some parents have tried to justify their course by quoting the words of Christ. And that is, it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. But the same reasoning would prove that men then can labor on the Sabbath and because they must earn bread for their children, there's no limit, no boundary to show what or what should not be done on the Sabbath. See, a lot of times they, they, they do, oh, well, the, the, Jesus said, you know, we should do good on the Sabbath. Do you know how much you can disrespect God and play with Him like a joke with that? Oh, uh, Jesus said to do good on the Sabbath, so therefore uh, I'm, I'm going to go to work because, you know, there's nothing wrong with working. That's doing good. And, uh, hey, taking my family out to eat at a restaurant, that, that's not bad. It's good. So... When Jesus said do good on the Sabbath, He meant do good for His cause, where glory and honor will be given to Him. Hey, it's a good thing to go out of the park and play with your kids. Not on the Sabbath. Our brethren cannot expect the approval of God while they place their children where it is impossible for them to obey the fourth commandment. Woo! Please God, speak to us. Our brethren, that's all of us cannot expect the approval of God while they place their children where it is impossible for them to obey the fourth commandment. 
They, the parents, should endeavor to make some arrangement with the authorities whereby the children shall be excused from attendance of school upon the seventh day. And if this fails, look at this, then their duty is plain to obey God's requirement, whatever the cost. Oh, we don't have Christians like this anymore. Anything regarding school is not to honor and worship God. It is breaking the commandment if you do it on the seventh day. Taking exams. Sp oh. Sports. I kid you not. Not too long ago, I had a family, not in this church, at a previous church that I pastored. The family was strong. They all got baptized. They were doing so well. Until one of the kids got an opportunity to be on a prestigious sports team. And you know what's sad? That was too much temptation, not for the kid, for the parent. The parent, I actually spoke to this person and said, look, I understand if your kid likes soccer, basketball, football, whatever, there's a lot of teams that he can join, a lot of varsity, which doesn't require him to play on Friday nights or Saturdays. Yeah, yeah, but those are like whatever little weenie teams. This is a prestigious team, and I want my boy to be on a team where people will go, ooh, ah, wow. And they ended up all leaving the church. All because I want my kid in a prestigious team. <laughs> Beloved, by God's grace, I don't want people going, ooh, ah, wow, to how far my son can throw, how keen his aim is at firing a basket. By God's grace, I want people to be, ooh, oh, wow. That kid is only a teenager and he honors the Sabbath like no one I've ever seen. Amen. That's what's going to count. Sports, games, recitals, ballerina classes, karate classes, TV commercials, modeling, dance recitals, cheerleading, all of these things are okay, well, to a degree. But not on the day that God said, everything in this day must be to honor and glorify me. That's why God said in Isaiah 58, 13, our scripture reading for this morning, how do you keep the Sabbath? You don't do your own ways. You don't follow your own roads. You don't seek your own pleasures. You don't even speak your own words because everything you do, say, think, breathe should be so focused and drenched on God. Amen. Going to a karate tournament is not going to honor God. Going to cheer, going to shoot a commercial, going to a dance recital, going to a, a varsity team playoff, going to whatever. Those are things that upon your own study, you can maybe do them during the week. But the Sabbath is the day of the Lord thy God. Amen. Oh, don't even get me started on visiting and receiving family and friends. That's probably one of the most popular ones. Oh, we're not going to be able to make it to church because uh, we're going to go and uh, visit some friends. We're going to go and visit some family. We're going to go and visit... You know what? Now, don't get me wrong. If you're going to visit a family member, and this has happened before. In fact, there's somebody here right now who just recently did this. If you're going to visit a family member because you want to try to show them Jesus Christ, and you want to try to lift them out of the sinking sand they're going into, that's very different. But I'm talking about, oh, we're just going to go kick it. The number of times, hey, what happened? We missed your church. Oh, we had family stop by. And I said it last week. That's fine. You know what? I got family too. But you see, my family 
knows me and my family well enough that they're not going to show up at my door on Sabbath. Because they know that on Sabbath, I keep the day holy and I'm in church. And this was way before I was a pastor, by the way. But like I've always said, hey, family shows up on my door on Sabbath? Great, beautiful, we're all going to church. But I'm not staying home. The number one Bible verse, beloved, that answers all the questions about keeping the Sabbath day holy. Today's scripture reading, Isaiah 58, 13 and 14. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, this is what is honorable. Thou shalt honor him, how? How do you honor? Thou shalt honor him by not doing thy own ways, nor finding thy own pleasures, nor speaking thy own words. Yeah. Couldn't be more clear. Couldn't be more clear for those that are truly seeking truth. Did you catch that? Oh, but you think, why? Why does God do this, man? Why does God give so many rules? Have you ever asked yourself, why did God ask Naaman to dip into that filthy river seven times? God could have easily said, you're cured, boom. You guys remember the story? When Naaman went to the prophet Elijah? He could have just said, oh, you want healing? Lord, heal him, boom, done. No, what did God say? Go out to the dirtiest, filthiest, scum-covered river and dip yourself in there seven times. Why? What's the point of that? Wouldn't it be just easier to just cure me? Why did God tell his people led by Joshua, march around Jericho seven times? You wanna win the battle? Seven days you're gonna be marching around Jericho. Why? What's the point that all you're gonna do is get a callus on our feet? Make our knees, our backs hurt. Why do we have to walk seven days? Well, interesting. Seven, seven, seven. Hmm. Why did God tell, you guys remember, the widow of Zarephath? She was starving to death. Had nothing to eat. She had just a little bit of flour left and a few drops of oil. And the Bible says she was going to make the last meal for her and for her son. And then they were going to die. And here comes Elijah. Uh, can you make me something to eat? And the widow says, Sir, I would give you if I, I got nothing. I just got a little bit of flour left and a few drops of oil. It's our last meal and then we're going to die. Well, before you do that, can you make me something to eat? Why would God do that? And that is what the prophet said. God told me that you need to feed me first. Why would God leave Abraham without a son for almost a hundred years while Abraham is praying and praying and praying and praying, give me a son, only to give him a son and then say, kill him. Why would God do that? Could it be possible that it's all about one word? Obedience. Obedience to God. Because obedience to God is the key to spiritual growth. Beloved, following Christ has only two requirements. Trust and obey. Trust and obey. Amen. Trust and obey. Amen. Trust and obey. Amen. What did Jesus say in Matthew 7.21? Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
What is he saying? Not everyone that says they're a Christian is going to come into heaven. Who's going to come into heaven? That who does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Amen. You could say, Lord, Lord, hallelujah, all you want. It is only those who do the will of my Father, which means obey. Trust and obey. For there's no other way. Finishing up. Give me a couple minutes and I'm done. God has spoken and he means that this... I'm sorry. God has spoken and he means that man shall obey. He does not inquire if it is convenient for him to do so. The Lord of life and glory did not consult his convenience or pleasure when he left his station on high command to become a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, accepting public shame and disgrace and death in order to deliver man from the consequence of his disobedience. Jesus died not to save man in his sins, but from his sins. Man is to leave the error of his way to follow the example of Christ, to take up his cross and follow him, denying himself and obeying God at any cost. You see, beloved, just like the spirit of prophecy says, God is not asking how convenient it might be. God's not saying, oh, is this okay with you? Well, I'd like for you to come to the Sabbath school and, and, and keep the Sabbath, but only it's not gonna be inconvenient for you. But you know why he has the right to say that? Because when he found out that in order to save man, he had to give his life. He didn't say, um, that's a little inconvenient for me. If Christ was willing to do what he did for our salvation, we're not willing to do a quarter of 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 that for our salvation. Deny yourself. Those were the last words from the spirit of prophecy. That's also mentioned in Matthew 16, 24. And it's not only mentioned in Matthew 16, 24. Look at all these places in the Bible. Matthew, Luke, Mark, Galatians, 2 Corinthians, Luke, Romans, where you find Jesus saying, Deny yourself. Beloved, I'm the first one to admit, I know it's not easy to deny yourself. By nature, we want to just please ourselves. It's all about us. But this is why, beloved, this is why the Bible tells us in Matthew 7, 13, broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go thereat. But narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Oh, so many people are going to be lost. Why? Because they didn't want to deny self. Nah, 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 chale. I want to do what I like and what is pleasing to me now. You remember, and with this I'm going to end, Brother Robert's testimony this morning? Amen. With his permission and his blessing, I want to share the text message that almost brought me to tears last Sabbath. I received this text message Saturday night last week after the sermon of last week from Brother Robert. This is what he said. Good evening, Pastor Serna. I must admit that in the past, when I would get home around five o'clock, because get this, get this, see, see, oh man, God speak to us. I hope you guys can get this. This makes perfect sense. A text like this would come from someone like this. Robert is one of the first people here on Sabbath. Robert has beaten me several times to church. He's never been late to Sabbath school. He's here all, every single Sabbath. And he's here for AY. So that's why he gets home around 5 o'clock. But look what he tells me. You'd think, man, Robert does all this. Man, the last person that should be wondering if he's okay is him. But look what he sends me. Good evening, Pastor Serna. I must admit that in the past, when I would get home around 5, I felt as though I had devoted enough time at church. And that spending the last two hours of the Sabbath day doing my own pleasure wasn't such a big deal. Well, after today's sermon, I learned that breaking the Sabbath 
is a big enough deal that it could make my entire time at church not even be recognized by God since I wasn't keeping it holy for the entire Sabbath. I know that now. So thank you, Pastor Sona, for your teaching us the truth of God's Word. Amen. That text made everything that I do worth it. If everybody else here wants to say, you know what? To blankety blank with the Sabbath and the commandments, I want to do my own thing. Just one person getting it and saying, I know what this means to my life. I know what this means to my salvation and what I can do for my family as an example. That's enough. So I praise God how the Holy Spirit is working in our church. Amen. And I hope you guys got what I said when I said a text like that would come from someone that's already doing everything Robert does. Because it's obvious when someone is truly seeking to do the best they can to live according to the light they receive. Oh, beloved, at all times and in all places, God requires us to prove our loyalty to Him. How? By honoring the Sabbath. That's how we prove our loyalty to Him, by honoring the Sabbath. This is the quote that I ended with last week and the one I end with now. The Sabbath, keeping it holy, is a test. Not a human requirement, but God's test. Keeping it holy. It is that, keeping the Sabbath holy, which will distinguish between those who serve God and those who serve Him not. And upon this point will come the last great conflict of the great controversy between truth and error. And yes, beloved, I am talking about, uh, once again, the mark of the beast and the seal of God, which we're not going to get into now because that's not what today is about. But please, beloved, remember, as we end this morning's message, God also says, those who honor me, I will honor. We honor God, He will honor us in return. That loyalty will not go unseen or unheard. Beloved, I ask you again, did the three Hebrews show loyalty to God? Amen. Did God show them loyalty? Amen. Did Daniel show loyalty to God? Did God show loyalty to Daniel? Amen. And again, what do you think is easier? This kind of loyalty? <laughs> or this kind of loyalty? Because beloved, <laughs> if you for one second think, uh, I don't really feel down with this, you know, that looks pretty early, that looks probably like, like nine in the morning, they're all dressed in their suits and who knows how, what, they probably got up at five in the morning. <laughs> If that's the way you're looking at this, you don't have a prayer to pass this kind of test. This test is a million times easier than the test that's just around the corner. My work, I told you this was the last one. Okay, this is really the, really the last one, I promise. Just for you guys to see why I do what I do. What's my job? The pastor's work, <clears throat> Spirit of Prophecy, Ministry to the Cities, page 48. Wake up the church members that they may unite in doing a definite and self-denying work. That is my job, beloved. Ministers of Jesus should stand as reprovers to those who fail to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. So folks, this is why I do what I do. And if this means that my church is going to get smaller because I don't preach what people want to hear, remember, when you preach what they want to hear, that's when they're full. When you preach the truth, no, it's not that full. But that's because most people don't really want the truth. They just want the constant reassurance that what they believe is truth. Well, if that's what you want, you're in the wrong church, beloved. We will preach, thus saith the Lord, at any cost. Remember the Sabbath day, beloved, to keep it holy. 
Next Sabbath, we conclude the Sabbath study of how to keep it holy with part three of how to keep it holy. But for now, let us stand up.